in that essay about Aikido, I was, in a sense, trying to, if you will, transcend Aikido, the martial art, to a particular mindset. And, you know, I continue doing those really hardcore martial arts that I do. And my teacher, who was a very rough and very scary human being, one time said to me after 12 years of teaching me, he said, you're a waste of time. You're a waste of my effort. I don't know why. And I was his last student too. And said, so, you're a waste of human flesh, basically. And um, he said, you came all the way to Japan, abandoning your own life to study power, and you don't use it. And he says, now, some of you may find this sexist, but what the heck. He says, the only purpose of a man's life is to exert power on the world. That's it. And he says, if you don't exert power on the world, you can't even call yourself a man. So if we can expand that to call yourself a human being, let's be happy together. Um, but I, I, I grew to be quite ashamed because he was right. Uh, you know, I was teaching junior high school English. I was writing technical manuals in a labeling machine factory, not very important things. And I was studying this very deep, powerful information. And I, I, he says to me, I don't care if you become a police or a terrorist. It makes no difference to me that you've got to exert power in the world. Well, I figured if I'd acquired power, perhaps I should use it in a worthwhile way. And I was really struggling for a couple of years what I was going to do. And I found this area of crisis intervention, which is a subset of psychology, where you intervene with people who are suicidal, who may be homicidal due to psychiatric disorders, maybe in a psychotic state, and meeting them face to face and, if you will, using whatever power I have in here to move them to a place of greater safety and perhaps protect other people uh, it seemed to be a worthwhile way to live my life. And on that level, I ended up feeling if you are not actively training in a military, a modern military art as say special operations, or actively training as a police officer to combat criminals when they try to hurt you, all martial arts are the same. I don't care if you're doing uh, MMA, doing Aikido, doing Karate, doing Kenjutsu, doing Kudo, to me, it's all the same. It is a, an as if study, as if something will happen, as opposed to um, a practical study. And I don't mean that in any sense disrespectful. In a sense, we're all doing the same thing, whatever martial art we choose. And um, so for me, the, the, the difference between training Aikido as opposed to training something else, often in a way it's like, well, that's just personal choice. What are we going to do with this intense study we're doing? And how does that actually contribute to um, uh, the power that we acquire? How does that contribute to making a better life? And that could be just being a better parent, protecting your family can be part of that. But to me, that's what this is. And for me, I came up with this concept of ethical compassion and ethical compassion as opposed to the way most people think of compassion. Most people think of compassion, I feel sorry for you or I'm concerned about you. I have good wishes toward you. For me, ethical compassion is having the power and the will to actually do what's necessary to make things better, to make things safer. And that could include martial, if you will, martial acts. That could include force. That could include a lot of force. Some of my, uh, my closest friends are law enforcement officers who are prepared in certain situations to shoot somebody and they're the most compassionate human beings I know. So there's, I'm not, to me, ethical compassion is not pacifism. It's, it's, it's something that martial arts have fueled for me uh, and it has given me the courage, for example, to step in someone's house uh, who may be in an acute psychotic episode, and I don't know what weapons are in the house or whatever, but I make the evaluation, it's safe enough that this isn't suicidal that I'm stepping into that home and that I'm going to try to assist that person. Okay, so that's, so then questions. So what do I see here? Um, what do you think the connection between spirit and training is in the context of mat time technique? Ritual dancing is mentioned or is it that physical acts of pushing the body's limits, trying to access through endorphic highs? Your thoughts. Okay. So first of all, 
Um, I don't think, I, I think endorphins are cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, endorphins are natural neurohormones, which are opiate analogs and give a sense of well-being. Uh, there are high levels of endorphins in breast milk. There are, uh, when, when we stress the body, we get levels of endorphins. That feels wonderful. Um, there's a book, oh gosh, what is the name of it? I think it's called DMT, the spirit molecule, which postulates, so DMT is a very, very powerful psychedelic, um, perhaps the most powerful um, chemical that affects the brain in that way. And DMT, the spirit molecule, was studying um, what happens to people when they're given clinical doses in a safe setting. And one of the things we know about DMT is it exists, exists naturally in the brain, in the pineal body, which some people have postulated that they call it the third eye. Now, the pineal body's prime function is releasing melatonin and serotonin. Melatonin, when it's time for sleep, we get a wave of melatonin, we get sleepy. And then as the light hits through our closed eyes in the morning, naturally, serotonin is released, which contradicts the melatonin, wakes us up. But in addition, there is DMT in the pineal body, so why aren't we perpetually high? Apparently, it is only released in the body when the body is in extreme states of stress. Childbirth, death, perhaps birth, uh, and periods of privation, starvation, uh, uh, exposure to the elements. In other words, it's very possible that the shamans stress themselves in this way so that they could get this release of DMT, which either makes as high as one aspect way of thinking of it. Other people, some very significant theorists believe that it provides access to other states of consciousness that we're actually perceiving real beings, if you will, or real states of being. So Shugyo, to get those kind of effects that O-sensei probably had, requires a really surpassingly intense level of training. But the real question is, and I, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but a rabbi once wrote, he's a Kabbalist, he said, I have no doubt that the priests of the Inquisition perceived exactly the same things that I perceive when I go into mystical states. That is not the question. The question is what you bring home. And so, you know, what home is, is we've got this body with desires with, you know, and drives, aggressive drives, uh, uh, amoral sexual drives, all of that. And it, it's morality is not spirituality. They're two different states. Spirituality, in my view, is, shall I say, this individual gets a perception of uh, a unified existence. Ethics is that there is somebody else out there, somebody who is not me, uh, somebody who I have responsibility for. And uh, the philosopher who's most influenced me in this is a man named Emmanuel Levinas, that he had this formulation, ethics precedes ontology. And the idea is, is that um, before being itself, we are born in an ethical relation to those who birth us. Uh, there's another person out there that's not me. And if you don't appreciate that, then you can be a very, shall I say, spiritual person and be utterly amoral, is my opinion, right? So in the question that I have there, match time can do two things. It can develop an intoxicating level of power. And intoxicating, I think, is a great word because toxic, poisonous level of power, potentially. While I'm doing so, do I have, how do I treat my training partners? How do I treat the people I'm with? That the higher I get, the easier it is for me to get out of control. Oops, I injured you. Well, I just don't know my own power, right? So um, one last point, and then I'll go on to another question. My mother was the first female uh, cantorial soloist, first female cantor in a synagogue in America. And I asked her when she sang, is she perceived God? And she looked at me and said, Ellis, I'm not allowed to do that. She's a very stern woman. And I said, what do you mean? She said, it's my responsibility 
through my prayers and through my singing to assist other people to be close to God. If I reached God at those moments, I would lose the melody. And so she felt an ethical responsibility greater than reaching God to help other people reach God, if you will, the bodhisattva ideal. And so to me, um, I think that Shugyo can do two things at once. It can make us more and more powerful, potentially, and I believe it should, make us more and more responsible. Okay. So next question, Tony Doubleday. If Aikido is akin to Kagura, then I suppose it's a form of ritual performance of the Weishibu's insight. The question I've often pondered is whether we need some other method, whether Shingon, Zen, or whatever, to, in order to appreciate how Aikido is a ritual that fully expresses the Weishibu's understanding in a way that we can readily access. How do you see this? That's a wonderful question. Um, I have a line in Dueling with O-Sensei, I can't remember it exactly, but something like, I often question if Aikido is the best way to achieve Aikido. And the reason I ask that question is, if you enter a Shingon sect, if you enter Zen, whatever, there is actually a curriculum, not step by step per se, but there is a curriculum by which one advances. Weishiba enacted his rituals in front of people, but did not walk people through. Um, now, the two aspects of this, one aspect is the andragogy, which is pedagogy for adults, the andragogy of how he taught, which was the steal the technique uh, uh, um, method, which I call learning by osmosis. If you spend yourself enough time around a teacher and you're willing to be, and the word I use is infected by the teacher, you can learn a, very deeply what they're offering. Of course, it also is permutated by your perceptions. I remember um, my Arakiri teacher's wife one time commented, I can't believe how much he looks like you when he moves. And my teacher was five foot eight, I'm six foot six. Uh, you know, we're very different structurally. Our bodies are very different, hips are very different, but I allowed myself to be infected. Now there's a danger in being infected that you absorb a lot more than the physical movements, right? So you can absorb all the flaws of an individual's personality very easily when you are that open to a teacher. And I think that's a problem of Aikido, to be quite honest with you. I've seen certain Aikido groups with a charismatic teacher and everybody has absorbed the worst of that teacher along with their beautiful movements, okay? So on the one level, as far as I know in the literature, the only person that Ueshiba allegedly taught explicitly was Yukawa, his, his nephew, who was this titanically strong guy. And I remember reading somewhere, Shirata Rinjiro said, we used to ask Yukata, uh, Yukata, Yukawa what Ueshiba Sensei taught, because apparently he taught him explicitly. Um, there's some evidence, by the way, that of course he, you'd think, well, did he teach Doshu Kishomaru? I think so. And I've got an appendix in Hidden in Plain Sight, which is an account of Kishomaru Sensei teaching a couple people, shall I say, old school Daito Ryu techniques. If ever anybody wants to break your dojo, here's how to handle them. Well, he had to have learned that from his dad, right? And so the pro back to Tony's question, I think it's a real problem, particularly at how many generations removed of trying to understand the depths of what Ueshiba was teaching when he didn't teach it, he just enacted it. I think the classic example of that is the solo Joe point, uh, which I think I, I wrote an article on um, my, I have a, a, a website for my shorter writing called kogenbudo.org, K-O-G-E-N-B-U-D-O. Alice, we're losing your audio. Yeah. Ah, it's my hand in front of my mouth, I think. Um, so kogenbudo.org, and it was about two years ago, I was on a, near a beach in Kamakura, and I saw a Shinto ritual 
to uh, Vishimonten, uh, goddess of the sea, and they were using a, 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 a spear replica, a hoko, and it was O-sensei's movements. I mean, there were aspects that were clearly out of that Joe form. And I think what O-sensei did was he took those uh, uh, Shinto, if you will, semi-dance with a pseudo weapon and re martialized it, put more movements of martial integrity. So he was just doing this in front of people. And I think any one of you has seen the utterly insipid way so many people do that Joe form. It's just painful. There's a lack of both God or power in it, you know? Um, so I, I think the question is, I think you have to go outside Aikido and explore, be it on a spiritual thing, something like uh, uh, Shingon, or it could be other martial arts, and keep reflecting back. To me, Aikido is this kind of a puzzle. It's a martial art, but it's not a martial art. It's not a religion, but it certainly has religious aspects. It's a social education, and yet it's not. And I think the only way one gets anything approaching what a Weishabu is trying to do is you have to step outside and then reflect on what you learned outside and say, how does this fit with the Aikido I'm physically enacting? And the final point there is your benchmark is effective Aikido movement with physical integrity. Right, so that's a sort of like a carpenter's rule, okay? Whatever I learn and whatever I do is within these parameters. And the parameters are Aikido Waza. Otherwise, you could just you know, read 50 books and study 50 disciplines and really not get anywhere. But it's sort of like putting a frame around the picture. Whatever art occurs, occurs, occurs within this frame. And that's why the Weishiba had no problem with Tada Sensei and Tohei Sensei going to uh, um, uh, Shinshin Toyutsu and uh, uh, other people studying, uh, uh, like Terry Dobson going and training in uh, Shingi and Bagua. Or, you know, he found that kind of amusing. It's like, have at it, see what you can bring back. Because I think Ueshiba's perspective, this is just my assumption, I think his perspective is doing that makes you like me. That whatever... I was given, I had to step outside it to learn. And I think there's a possibility those people who are just faithful followers who enacted the techniques and never stepped out of the dojo, I don't think those were regarded as his best students. Otherwise, how could he have a place for, say, Mochizuki Minoru, uh, Tomiki uh, uh, Kenji, you know, from Aikido, Nakasona, Nakazone, not Nakazone, he was the prime minister, Nakazone, also a judoka right? Some of the most brilliant people. Uh, how could somebody like Nishio Shoji, who basically said, well, you, you talk about the Joe, but you're not teaching the Joe. I'll learn it elsewhere. You talk about the sword, I guess I'll learn it elsewhere. And Nishio Sensei was, as I put it, he proved that one could bow forward, but stand up straight, right? Uh, one didn't have to submit to what one imagined those Sensei was. There's more to it than that, right? And so I think, I think, Tony, I think you're right that the only way we can understand it, if we can't follow his footsteps exactly, is we have to follow analogs to his footsteps, which is our own, shall I say, our own study and our own journey. Okay, then uh, I've got a question from Gabor Zabo. To what extent do you think Ueshiba did change after World War II or before? Um, I think a wish of a change far less than many people claim. Uh, when you look at his technique, not when he was really elderly, I, you know, I ignore all the sort of waving hand stuff where people fall. I, I just, I'm not interested in that. But I'm interested in the middle when he'll actually grab hold of somebody or, you know, make physical contact. And then I'll look at the films from 1950 films from 1936, and there's a recent film that has come out of Ueshiba demonstrating Aikido in 1934, I think it is, at the Omoto-kyo headquarters. 
It's the oldest film of Ueshiba we have, and it's just come out. If you haven't seen it, uh, look up on YouTube, just type in Omotokyo Ueshiba, I think it'll come up that way. Um, and what I see is, I don't see that much difference physically in the technique. So then people like to say, well, he was a hard martial artist and then went to Iwama and had these spiritual insights and then created the art of peace. I think it's more complex than that. In 1949, uh, Hirata Miki, I think is an, uh, no, I have the wrong name, Mikami Taku. Mikami Taku was the assassin, the murderer of the prime minister of Japan, Inukai. And Ueshiba was hiding him out from the Americans in 1949 at Iwama. And, you know, he, he Tsunodomari sensei, who's one of the great, more spiritually oriented senseis, described visiting Ueshiba there and being introduced to this guy, right? So the idea that Ueshiba had this total turning of mind, I'm sure he was horrified by the war and the results of the war. I wonder how much he was horrified by what happened to the Chinese. I wonder. Because, you know, from what I've read, your microphone. Uh, is it, uh, okay, is it, am I back? Yeah. Okay. Many areas of China were, could be called an open air Auschwitz. You know, the, the, the Japanese army was going, was spreading uh, chemical warfare, experiments on people. They were making free fire zones in which people were just slaughtered. It was a horror show. You, you, you know, Ueshiba never expressed remorse from that. And so, again, this is what makes him complex. Like every human being, we kind of sector off our attention. But I think it's clear that, you know, he, like everybody else, was horrified by what had been brought to Japan or what Japan had brought to itself and Japan had brought to the world. And so his message, he emphasized, shall I say, this um, uh, uh, remaking the world. So I think there was some change in the way he emphasized his discourse. As best I can read of the pre-war stuff, he talked spirituality, but it was more unifying the cosmos. There was less talk about humanity. After the war, there was more talk about humanity. But technically, I don't see that there was that much difference. You know, you actually look at the films, you look carefully. Again, ignore the hand waving, right? But look at where there's physical contact, I think the techniques are pretty close to the same. Let's see, Mark. Uh, 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 oh, sorry, I'm doing these in order. Who do you find interesting as a teacher in current Aikido or martial circles today, particularly in regards to the more spiritual aspects you've been talking about? Robert, that's a tough question for me because I'm kind of out of the loop. Uh, I think one of the most interesting human beings doing Aikido today is Miles Kessler. And the reason I think Miles is interesting is, you know, I know nothing about his technique. I've actually never seen a film of him. But the fact that he's trying to teach Palestinian and Israeli kids together is remarkable to me. Um, the fact that he has children who are brought up to be enemies touching each other is one of the most significant things I could possibly imagine. Okay. So, you know, whether his technique's remarkable or not, I, I don't even care. That's, that's just special. Um, quite honestly, uh, Josh Gold in Aikido Journal, because I've been participating in a project with Josh, teaching Aikido for leadership for young people. And this is a great innovation, because rather than teaching anger management or conflict resolution, which are individual things, teaching young kids how to take a role using power to make society better by their own lights and using Aikido as a vehicle for doing so, I think is a remarkable project, okay? So those would be two people I think about in terms of the kind of spirituality that I'm interested in. But again, I'm, I'm really pretty well out of the loop of who current teachers are. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't get around that much. Let's see, 
Um, Mark, you made reference earlier to your dissolution with Aikido, leaving it and coming back. What is your position, opinion of Aikido now? What draws you to Aikido? Um, for me, one way I put it is Aikido is the martial art of the gray zones. Most of, we put it this way, we people in civilized society, a society where the rule of law exists, do not on a daily basis face violence. If I was truly living in an environment in which the possibility of having my life or my loved one's lives taken on a daily basis, and I couldn't leave, I would be armed with a firearm on a daily basis. Right? One of my friends, Larry Beery, who's a remarkable Aikido teacher, by the way, he described teaching in Detroit, and he met four young men who came in and they wanted to learn Aikido. And these four men were brothers. They were all teenagers. And when they walked in the dojo, one young man faced Larry and the others took points on the points of the compass, north, south, east, west. So they're facing in all directions. And so Larry's talking to one, the other three are listening and responding, but not looking at him. This is very odd. And Larry asked, why are you doing that? And they said, we live in a very heavy gang area and we swore we wouldn't be part of gangs. And so we have to protect each other. So wherever we go, we watch each other's back. So somebody who has to live like that, that's the, shall I say, the, needs the martial art of black and white. But for most of us, violence is not a daily experience or near a daily experience. And so whatever martial art we choose, is it going to make us more effective in interacting with other people and contributing something of use to humanity. Um, you say, well, gee, why not just go to an ethical culture meeting? Why not just go to the Unitarian Church or whatever? And I think the answer is that learning when I'm actually slightly physically afraid of you, learning when perhaps you're afraid of me with good reason or not, and we have to work together is a particular challenge to one's morality and responsibility for others. In the process, I get better. I get better able to protect myself, which I'm actually interested in. Probably will be to the day I die. Wanting to, and for two levels. One, I'd, I'd like to learn to be physically safer. I just find that fascinating and important. But also, it just channels my energy in a really interesting way. Uh, uh, it, it's some people refer to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as human chess. Well, I find all martial arts like that. And it's just, I just love it for itself. But what draws me to Aikido is this, just this tension between how martially effective is it? How do I make it more martially effective? What are these ethical things we talk about? How could, not only how could we achieve them, but how could they be violated? How easily is it to go astray from what you're trying to learn? Uh, you know, and you see that people, people come in with really good <laughs> intentions and they end up not so good. <laughs> um, so it, it's Aikido just creates a whole bunch of tensions in a particular way within me as a human being that I find, I find fascinating. So that's, are there more questions? Let's see. Um, I no, think, I'm, yeah, I, and I think uh, if you want to, because we're only a few people here, I think un, uh, unmute yourself and, and uh, speak to Alice. I think that's completely fine because there are not so many. So go ahead. So I've just posted another question, which is, you know, what, what do you do on a daily basis, uh, Ellis, or on a regular basis that sort of maybe not martially effective, uh, you know, martially sort of focused, but you find very beneficial for your sort of practice overall life? I mean, you've been talking about channeling your energy and things, but is there anything else that you do that you think, hmm, 
actually I would recommend this particular practice? You know, I have no meditative practice. I have no, say, religious practice. I do nothing that explicitly somebody would say, oh, that guy is studying morality. I don't do any of that. Um, my work, so, of course, with COVID-19, I'm not doing much work. But for me, one of the most interesting challenges is to teach people how to calm other people who are aggressive. But here's the interesting thing for me. I can successively days work with a group of border control officers who are trying to keep uh, illegal immigrants out, uh, out of America. And the next day, I'll be working with a social service agency which supports illegal immigrants who live in America. Right? Now, what my political views are on this or that, that's not the issue for me. The issue is how can I actually assist both of those people not be victims of violence, right? With somebody who is emotionally disturbed or whatever. And so to craft my message without pandering to anybody, to maintain my own integrity, but to be able to speak to people um, from very different backgrounds, this is to me the challenge to, are my values livable? Uh, a little plug, uh, I've written two clone books, one called The Coordinator, which is for military and police, but another called The Accord Agent, which is for, specifically for business, but it's managing highly problematic uh, interactions in a business environment. And that is, how do you organize yourself for human randori? How do you organize yourself so you maintain your integrity in situations where people who will never like you, never trust you, and yet you have to find some way to ethically communicate with them. So if you will, that's the closest thing I have to a practice. And so that's why, for example, today, um, I didn't want to have a prepared lecture. I don't enjoy that at all. Uh, what I enjoy is this, uh, you know, just uh, responding to a question, finding a way to weave whatever insight I may have into the frame of the discussion, in this case, the frame being Aikido. So that would be the main thing. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that my professional life directly challenges me in that way. Um, I might have a follow-up to that. Yes. Um, regarding the Shukyo um, and internal training, if we call it that, do you have a daily routine in, in that sense? I do. Um, I train uh, about two hours a day, and the some of it is just more strength stuff because I assume that the strongest of the our elders were all farmers, and because I don't farm, uh, I have to use other methods to get that kind of variable stresses on the body. So I do things like kettlebells. I have a slosh tube, which is a it's a 10 centimeter, uh, uh, three meter plus long uh, pipe that's half full of water. And so it moves. It's like having a training partner. And so when I pick it up and things, I walk around with it above my head, it's about uh, 40 kilos. And it wants to move. And so I move with it. So I, those are my, so I said, the more physical stuff I do. Um, I actually do some solo uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu routines on a bag because I have to do solo. My knees are so bad, I, I can't take the stresses anymore. Uh, but internal strength training, I do. I've worked uh, with a fellow named Mike Sigmund, mostly. And Mike has keyed me into a lot of exercises. I've altered some of the exercises myself. But I have uh, different exercises using a spear, uh, using what's called a can-do bar, which is a, a, a stiff piece of rubber that you twist just enough to put tension on your body, and then you move and you try to keep constant tension on it. So I've got a whole routine of that. Well, actually routine, every day I do it differently because I, I get easily bored. And uh, if I do the same thing every day the same way, uh, I'll stop doing it, which is why I never could meditate. I'm bored with myself very quickly. But so I vary the exercises every day. Um, and if anybody's curious, I don't 
I don't meditate while I'm doing it. I just, in a sense, I guess I do. I, I, I concentrate on the exercise itself, but I have no more goal than the exercise. Something may occur to me, but that's about it. You have time for one more question. It's about three minutes left. How much um, importance do you give to the practice of the spear, Alice? Um, well, I give a lot of importance to it for a couple reasons. The one is um, in both of the traditional martial arts that I train, at Akiru and Todabuko, you spear as a part of the curriculum. The other thing is um, spear with what's called spear shaking, which is a particular way of trying to um, use your whole body as a, a unit to uh, create a wave through the spear, teaches um, how to manage an object that's arguing with you. And use that, it, because the spear is a little bit heavy, it's, you know, it's extended away from your body. How do you make that part of your body for the purpose of the exercise? So not only is my whole body unified, my body and the spear are unified together. So yeah, it's very important to me. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's every day I do. Oh, gosh. Not a question, but a compliment. Thank you so much for writing the books that you write. They're absolutely brilliant. I absolutely love them. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, just as a, a two plugs on my books, because we have a minute left, I just released um, my mother's book on her career as a hospice social worker. It was unfinished. My sister and she wrote it, and I, I sort of edited it and polished it. And so it's called Final Chapters. And it's my mother meeting folks uh, uh, and treating, working with people at the end of their lives and their families. And I just your microphone. Ah, I just finished my second novel yesterday. Uh, my first novel is called The Girl with the Face of the Moon. My second one's called Lost Boy. And apropos to all these questions, I was blessed with uh, a One good minute. life. What's that? One minute. Yeah, I was blessed with a good life. I was blessed being brought up well. And so I spent a lot of years working in child abuse cases and often thought, here's somebody who deserves to die. Right? But because I was, I'm, I'd like to say, a relatively undamaged human being, those random thoughts I never came close to acting on. But I wondered, what would have happened to me if I'd been a damaged soul? And in particular, what would have happened to my relationship with somebody like my wife? And so I wrote a novel about a damaged good man who, because of the frailties of his own trauma, is in that job and is faced with that moral question. So that just got finished. Um, we'll see what happens with it. I'll, I'll, I'll announce on my website now. Thank you, Alice. Thank you so much. They're going to cut this off any second. So thank you so much for coming. I'm going to... Uh... Recording is going to be, uh, be up and I'm going to post it soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you very Thanks, much. Nice. Bye. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming.